NARS Chief Economist and the co-creator of the Case Shiller U.S. Home Price Index have called a housing bubble. Yep, they called it. That's how I see it. We're going to talk about that in a second. Welcome to Housing Bubble 2.0 News of the Week, or as I like to call it, another episode of As the Housing Market Turns. Today is the 17th of November. We're you know just a little, little over halfway through the month here. Again, the housing market's always moving fast. Things are changing on a daily basis. Randy Patrick here, your host, putting the realism back in real estate. And if you're not already a subscriber to my channel, I'd appreciate it if you'd help my channel grow and smash that subscribe button. Why should you subscribe? Well, very simple. I'm bringing the most relevant, up-to-date, real content in the housing market. That's what I do. All right, so as I'm saying, things are changing Things are quietly happening behind the scenes. So what I'm asking people to do is, if we spoke in the past about looking for property, buying property, uh, doing some consulting work for you, um, short sale opportunities, my education products, um, you know, you uh, large buying groups, whether it's single family homes, multifamily, reconnect with me because stuff is happening, and I think we need to start pushing that now because I see changes in at least my market down here and some of their markets across the U.S. So, you know, I've talked to a lot of people over the months. People engage, we chat, they fade out, phase out. Um, connect with me and get back on, on the wagon and we'll start doing some real estate because the time is now, folks. All right, so today we are going to talk about two people, Lawrence Yun, who is the uh, NAR chief economist, and Dr. Robert Schiller, who basically um, is, I guess you could say, the co-creator of the famous Case Schiller U.S. Home Price Index. And yeah, they were in the news the past couple of days, and it really is quite interesting. All right, so what we are going to talk about right now is how Nars Yun says medium home prices are rising much too fast. And to be honest with you, um, you know, the past, you know, you know, when the pandemic came in and things slowed down and everyone's concerned, we sort of popped out of the uh, the issue with, you know, record, you know, breaking home sales and values going up. Everything is great, great, great. Well, now he's kind of saying he's changing his tune a bit here going, hey, median home prices are rising much, much uh, or, or too much too fast for what's good for the market, I would say, I would imagine here. All right, so if we expand this a little bit, uh, you know, what he's stating is the fact that low mortgage rates and Record low housing inventory has driven home price increases throughout the year, according to National Association of Realtors, and that the median single-family home price grew year over year in all 181 metro locations that it tracks. So the U.S. median existing single-family home price rose 12% year over year to 313500 NAR said. On 117 metros, there were double-digit price gains from one year ago. For added perspective, in Q2, only 15 metros had double-digit price gains. So Q3, basically, um, we saw massive, uh, you know, double-digit gains in almost basically all the metros. All right. So uh, basically, what can help remedy high home prices? Finding a solution to the inventory crisis. Uh, the Lawrence Young, the chief economist, said. So basically, our inventory right now in Q3 is 19 percent lower than it was this time last year and there were enough homes in inventory to last 2.7 months of the current sales uh, price uh, as home prices increase both too quickly and too significantly first-time buyers will increasingly face difficulty in coming up with a down payment <coughs> excuse me and then he said transforming raw land into developmental lots and new supplier clearly needed to help tame home price growth all right uh, so basically, you know, favorable mortgage rates will continue to bring fresh buyers to the market. However, the affordability situation will not improve even with low interest rates because housing prices are rising much too fast. So this is really interesting. So what we really actually have NAR saying is that, hey, guys, you know what? We're actually hurting our market. We're, we're, self, we're sabotaging our own market because of the situation we're in. Now, you know, a few months ago, you know, they were, you know, they were crying the blues about, you know, this is a horrible market, the pandemic. Now we see, you know, their, you know, supposed V-shaped recovery ca happening with housing. And it's like, oh, everything's great. You know, this, you know, everything was an illusion. Housing bubble boys, you know, you're smoking it. Um, look what's happening here. The market's recovering. Everything's great. So, but, you know, he's changing his tune now. And, and, and this is what, you know, I think is interesting. So 
listen, the housing market's in a vicious cycle. And what I mean by that is, you know, you can see we just keep spinning. So it's like no way out of this. Like you're in a washing machine. It's not stopping, right? And so what, what he's saying here is that we need more new construction. When he talks about, you know, um, transforming raw land into developmental lots and new supply. Well, that means home builders, land developers, whatever. So he's not providing the solution. You know, the National Association of Realtors are not providing the solution, right? He thinks that this should go on developers and builders, right? Well, that's great. So home builders are building homes and we know that. Um, but where we need home building to focus is in the ho affordable home market segment, right? Which typically is, I mean, I look at that sub 250. Sub 250K is to me is affordable home uh, market. Now, depending on where you live or reside in the country, that, that might be, you know, poor poverty. I mean, if you're in California or the Bay Area in California, maybe your affordable home is $500,000, okay? But the point is, you know, that's the market that actually has to be satisfied. That's where the majority of the buyers can, can, can play in, right? Well, builders, they claim that they cannot afford to build uh, in, the, in the, the affordable home segment uh, grouping just because it doesn't make sense. Why? Well, land prices are up. So, of course, when you're in a real estate bubble, not homes don't always go up. Land and lot prices go up. So if I check out my market here, I see people are pushing the inventory or pushing the envelope on lots and, and land. So they figure, well, hey, if, if everything is up, I might as well raise my price too. So land is expensive now. Entitlement and development is expensive. You know, material costs are expensive, right? Lumber costs have been up. Other costs have been up. And labor costs, labor costs or skilled labor costs are up. And just as a, as a you know, side note, a lot of skilled labor left the country um, apparently back after the last housing crisis. So, you know, everything was being built up and then when everything stopped, they went home. You know, that's a lot of them are maybe immigrant workers. So again, the housing market is is choked right now. Uh, there's no or very few foreclosures available. Why? Because we have three levels of moratoria going on now. You have the FHA moratoria, the CDC moratoria, and your individual state may have its own level of moratoria, moratorium going on, uh, preventing foreclosure sales or evictions or whatever. So what that basically is doing is further choking the market. And yeah, there's a protection element for homeowners and tenants in there, but also it's un unnaturally or artificially choking the market and causing it to, to strain. And there and therefore now we're having high prone prices and low inventory, right? So, you know, we're, we're doing this to ourselves. Um, low interest rates do create buying power, of course, because yeah, as he's saying here, going, yeah, it's great. Low interest rates, record low rates allows us to buy higher so it allows us to, to i guess you could say increase our buying power but it's not driving prices down so in other words you know your home is not less expensive because your mortgage rates cheaper ultimately right what do the low rates also do they drive refis so if i'm a homeowner and i go gee i'd like to move but you know what you know if i sell my house i'm going to have to buy a home that's just as expensive or even more expensive than, than what I'm in now. So therefore, I'm not gaining on my equity if I sell. So therefore, I'm just going to stay in my home. I'm going to refi and tap into my equity. Well, guess what? If I'm refining as opposed to selling, that means less homes in the market. So what is the solution here? There really is no solution. We just keep going round and round and round, which I think is very frustrating for home buyers and also investors now too, because I can tell you, you know, clearly I talk to a lot of people and I know your sentiments on buying a primary home, a home to live in just for you and your family. And that's challenging enough. Now we're, if I look at the investment side of the marketplace, that's crazy out there. There's no REOs. There's very little off market going on. And the off market stuff that's being passed on or shown is, is ridiculously expensive or it's garbage material. All right. Simple as that. So what is the solution? Well, prices have to come down, but we're, we keep stoking the fires. It's a vicious circle. So, you know, again, um, having low interest rates with low inventory at the top of the market to me means there's no other place it can go, but the bubble has to burst. If you don't agree with that, so that's your prerogative, but this typically is a bubble scenario. That's how bubbles work. All right. Now, bubbles, <laughs> bubbles, not the problem is what happens after the bubble. So again, going to the next segment here is home prices are in a bubble full stop. So now we've got another, um, disclosure here and this is a this is from Bloomberg and there was an article written by a guy called Aaron Brown here and what he's doing he's he's quoting I guess uh, Robert Dr. Robert Schiller uh, spoke recently and you know funny enough that um, I haven't heard him speak on the housing market since before the pandemic all right and this is why I think it's kind of unique that he's coming out right now basically you know 
this article sort of regroups of, of what he, he sort of created another another little index and, and he's another little calculation. So we're talking about that. So basically it says consider that, the, you know, um, so sorry, the rapidly housing prices, rising prices in the U.S. has led to talk on their housing bubble, like the one that helped trigger the last financial crisis a little more than a decade ago. Consider, consider that the Case-Shiller Home Price Index has gained in excess of 6% per year on average since January 2012, uh, while net rental income has barely kept up with inflation, uh, increasing in just less than 2% a year. The result is home prices seem as overvalued as they were in the spring of 2005, nine months before the peak. And I know that Schiller's talked about this before, is that, you know, you can see the peak before it's at the peak, okay? There's signs there, the economists, the analysts look at it and they go, hey, we're trending, you know, too high, too hard. Um, you know, we already see it plateauing, we're, we're peaking. So basically, that's what's going on. So what, what he has done is he's, he wanted a way to measure this, all right? So uh, ultimately, he said, one way to measure home valuations is with a cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio. So that's short form for CAPE, C-A-P-E. So cyclically, cyclically adjusted price to earning ratio developed by Yale University professor and Nobel laureate Robert Schiller for stocks. Okay. The concept can be applied to a broad swath, 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 whatever you want to call it, um, of assets by dividing the current price of an asset by the average annual inflation adjusted earnings over the prior 10 years. The chart below shows the CAPE for U.S. home prices and the S&P 500 index since 1996. So what he, what Schiller's saying here is that, hey, you know, this, if the stock market's in a bubble, the housing market's in even a bigger bubble. So uh, if you take a look at the chart, chart there, that's the CAPE index he created. So the blue line is housing and the black line is stock. So we can see you know, the peak and we can see the valley in 2012 and we can see where we are now. So basically what he's saying is the fact that, you know, home values are closer to their record highs than stock values, all right? So, um, you know, I guess you could say mo much of the focus of the housing uh, market has centered on the short-term environment with low inventory cited for rising prices and a jump in rental vacancy rates driving rents lower. But if the concern is the possibility of major economic disruption rather than just whether houses are good investments at current prices, the focus should be on long-term macroeconomics. Sure, real estate prices always drift up or down and differ by location and type of home, a bubble in housing requires widespread overvaluation over years, which is what we have witnessed. All right. So where that arrow is at the bottom, that basically is, that's, that's the quote, okay? Widespread overvaluation over years, which is what we have witnessed. So basically, that's what he's saying. All right. So we are an overvalued market. So then we're in a bubble market, right? So there's, there's you know, and if he's saying the, our, our housing market is, is in a bigger bubble than or the bubble is greater than than the stock market bubble. Okay, so um, what also he basically wanted to say that home values are worrisome, but for different reasons than 2006. One minor point of comfort is the run up from 96 to 2006 displayed a classic bubble pattern of accelerating prices increases near the peak, so it was exponential. Uh, the increase in valuation since 2012 has been linear, with no sign of steepening. So we've we've sort of been increasing at a, at a, at a you know, linear pace. Uh, and it, it hasn't slowed down. So, you know, last bubble was growth, growth, big time growth and crash. We've been on a trajectory over the past, you know, eight years since 2012. Uh, and, you know, he said that, you know, the bigger difference is in, is in this chart below. Um, it basically is looking at uh, ratio for housing versus 10 year US Treasury notes. Um, again, I'll put the link to here if you can read it a, a bit more. But the whole point is that um, ultimately, you know, Everything is trending upward and we are in, you know, it's higher, you know, I guess you say higher home values, values uh, associated with higher yields, all right? So that's a scoop. So um, ultimately, in the end, you know, when you take, again, this is easier just for you guys to look at on your own. I'll put the link here. But the, the point is, and this is kind of a, a good little paragraph here. It says, today's high valuations can be explained by low interest rates, as has been the usual pattern in the past. Uh, that might lead one to expect a typical correction where housing prices deflate over a few years with differences among regions. Many homeowners are hurt in places where prices are especially high and also in places where uh, economics are especially bad. But nationally diversified mortgage securities follow historic trends and financial institutions deal with losses seamlessly. Um, homeowners who can wait out the decline will see valuations increase above the purchase prices in five years or so. Like he said, when we have an adjustment, if you if you hunker down and you ride it out, eventually you know the market pops back up. All right. So um, the bad news is all previous history came at higher mortgage rates. 
the average 30-year fixed mortgage rate fell below 3% for the first time in August 2020. And rates are close to the lowest possible levels given credit risk and cost of writing mortgages. So really, there's not much wiggle room, all right? It's one thing to be at peak valuation. It's another to be at peak valuation with no discernible upside. So really, um, you know, he, what he's saying is that we're kind of at the peak right now. And, you know, you can't drop rates any lower. So what's going to happen? I mean, we're, we're bubbling. And, you know, I think that the next logical, I guess, you know, step forward is there has to be change and things have to come down. It's implausible that housing prices can go up from here without large increases in rents, uh, which requires increases in demands for housing. That's an unlikely outcome in a recession. If a recession continues, where will the new demand come from? If it ends, interest rates go up, pushing housing prices down. So he's kind of predicating the thing that as rates will have to go up at some point in time, uh, you know, and until we see that, we're going to keep seeing this bubble play out, which is unreal. And, um, you know, again, he, now, you know, he has to temper this, right? The good news, this is not a disaster market. Uh, there's no evidence home price declines could threaten financial system nor create the mass economic distress we saw in 2007. Well, that's right. There's no that home price declines might not do that right now, but we do have a financial crisis going on that's caused by something else. It's caused by COVID and shutdowns and job losses and other economic issues. So housing is not going to be a major contributor to what's already been happening, all right? Um, basically, um, the bad news is there's a lot more downside than upside from the average home buyer, and some of them are very likely to suffer in 2021. So what he's basically saying is that, guess what, guys? Um, you know, we're going to have these forbearances and foreclosure problems in 2021 as time goes on. That's where things will start to out unravel and stuff will happen. So uh, as I go into one of my first slides going, you know, I'm preparing for this now. I'm already seeing activity in my market uh, that's starting to open up. So that's what you have to do is you got to be ahead of the curve. You can't be waiting for stuff to take place and look in the rear view mirror and, and decide oh, I need to buy a house or invest or or take action. You got to do it now. You got to, we have to, you know, we have to, I guess you foresee what's going to happen and lay the groundwork now to be ready for the stuff when it when it sort of falls apart. That's my point here. Okay, so once again, um, you know, here's what I find with him. Now, realize I don't know either of these two guys, Lawrence Young or Robert Schiller. I've never spoken with them, never interviewed with them. I just read stuff in the media, get their books, whatever, okay? So to summarize what, what Schiller is saying in this Bloomberg article is that he, he is calling a bubble. So, you know, basically that's, you know, he's sort of. Like, see, he has this way of, I call it Robert Schiller double talk, okay? So he'll say something that I think is, you know, somewhat, I, I won't say the word alarmist, but kind of going, hey, you know, there's a bubble here. We got stuff going on. I'm concerned. And then he tempers it with, well, we could have a problem, but here's how we may not have a problem. And I wouldn't bet on it, but I wouldn't discount it. So basically that, that's been his, his discussion for the past couple of years. He states we have a bubble, states we could have problems. He's hedging his bet. He can't or won't commit. And I, and I think it's, it's because you know, um, of where he's at today. He's looked on in the economy as being, you know, someone you, that, you know, you look to for quotes and indications as to where housing's going. So, you know, I, I think, you know, he either doesn't want to or knows better or, you know, maybe there's more at stake, you know, for him personally than we realize here. But he won't c commit to what's going to happen in the future. It's sort of a pattern with him. The last uh, time he was interviewed back earlier in 2020, um, and, and I spoke about that, you know, probably it was, Maybe uh, it was before the pandemic and he was talking about where the market was headed. He was saying at that point in time that, yeah, we got some concerns. We see some bubbles growing here. Um, we got to monitor this and stuff. You know, his point was, you know, once we see what happens with the spring selling season, better, better determine what's going to happen in the future of housing. Well, didn't see the spring um, selling season. Why? Because everything happened so fast and COVID hit. So it, it changed everything. So, again, I just want to say, you know, again, I'm not discrediting anything these guys are saying. They're obviously smart, well-educated, and experienced guys in the financial industry. But um, it's what they're telling us and via the media that I think is problematic. And I see patterns here. So this guy, Robert, won't you know commit. And he, it's sort of a pattern with him. And, and it's funny because he, he put a book out. And um, I bought the book hoping, and this is back in 2019, so I bought the book immediately. And I was hoping to that he would explain or gain some insight in the housing market, you know what I mean? Because that's, you know, we follow him. I mean, he's got the, you know, he's the co-creator of the number one 
it's the you know Standard and Poor, you know um, Core Logic Standard and Poor U.S. Home Price Index. I mean that's so a lot of names associated behind that. Okay, and, and who's utilizing it? And, and and you know we all tend to sort of look at that as kind of the be all and end all of where the housing market's headed and how we measure it. Well, so he has his book out here, and you know this is his book, and I'm not promoting anything. Well, so I'm just saying this is his book. Okay, which I bought immediately when it came out, and and you know I, I thought okay I'm going to learn some things, and in the end. There's only one chapter on housing, and he talks about the history of housing and kind of how we got here. Uh, but he literally has one page on the housing market today, which is today and the future. So one page, one page. And ultimately, in the one page is a discussion on um, the narratives and how the narratives of 2005, when Alan Greenspan talked about frothy markets, and how that became, you know, a very, um, I guess you could put it, well um, publicized quote or interview. Him and Ben Bernanke said the same thing: frothy markets. And he and he sort of implying here that the power of the media sort of, you know, made us believe that we were in a bubble. So therefore, the bubble happened. Um, you know, um, whatever. That's kind of how I look at it. Going. Um, basically is talking about it contributed to a colorful and quotable constellation of narratives among the narratives with the power to change economic behavior and to bring on a financial crisis. So that's all he's really saying. So he's, he didn't really comment about the housing bubble. He just basically said, you know, the narrative was what did it. And his book is called Narrative Economics. All right. So I guess that's what we're looking at right now. So I'm disappointed, but hey, it is what it is. And, um, you know, we just have to remember that narratives are sort of what's going on in the world right now. And that's the, the nature of the media and where we're at. All right, guys, um, on an, another front here, I just found this interesting. Um, so Airbnb. So we've talked about Airbnb uh, being, you know, like what's going to happen with shutdowns, travel restrictions, you know, mortgage, forbearance, like all, all the things. So ultimately, you've got Airbnb who has is, is, a, is a company who has, you know, hosts who rent out their their um, homes and, and, and properties for short-term rentals and the fact that, you know, major major issues are happening with Airbnb because of, and the host, because of the pandemic and shutdowns and lack of travel and all the things you got to go through. Um, so it's, it's difficult. Now, along with the, the hotel industry as well, too. Well, Airbnb was planning uh, this time last year to go, uh, like earlier in the year, they were talking about their IPO, initial public offering, to go public. And it um, looks like they're at it again. Uh, but this little, this is interesting. This is from Zero Hedge. It says, you know, amid tumbling revenues and headcount, no path to profitability, Airbnb files for an IPO. And ultimately it is, you know, um, this time Airbnb right at the heart of the pandemic lockdown impact uh, and the 350 page S1, which is, I guess, their, their offering, uh, shows the bloodbath the year has been. Um, the document shows that leading up to the coronavirus outbreak, uh, earlier this year, Airbnb was spending heavily on technology and marketing to grow its business. Um, in the beginning, two friends opened their door. 13 years later, 4 million Airbnb hosts have opened theirs. So that's kind of a nice tagline there. But when you take a look at what's going on, these guys have taken a beating this year. And it's no surprise. So I, I, I wonder, why are they doing this now? But uh, Airbnb reports a net loss of $696.9 million. Uh, for the nine months and it's September 30th, that's not even the year. That's just nine months. Uh, a decrease of 374.1 million over the year. Um, COVID-19 is mentioned 251 times in their offering memorandum. Airbnb says it's not possible to predict the pandemic's ultimate impact on the future of business. Um, so COVID-19 has materially, if, ad, materially adversely affected our recent operating and financial results and contributing to. Uh, materially adversely impact of our long-term operating financial needs. So uh, in the end, basically, um, in 2019, their gross booking value, the GBV, was $38 billion. During the, the nine months and of September 30th of this year, COVID sent its uh, GBV gross booking value tumbling to $18 billion, down almost 40% year over year. So that's pretty significant, okay? Um, <clears throat> $38 billion uh, going down to $18 billion. <clears throat> um, that's a lot, okay? That's half of what they were doing before. Uh, Airbnb's revenue took a hit from the pandemic, down 32%. Um, and, and what it further talks about, uh, it's, it's obviously it's got cash and equivalents, you know, as a backing, but um, it looks like um, 
It points to slowing revenue growth and no guarantee of profitability. Uh, essentially, um, Airbnb is cutting its full-time uh, employee headcount by 25%. It also states that 86% of its hosts are located out the U.S. Uh, the company does business in 220 uh, countries. So um, I don't know about that, but that to me is not, does not sound like a very attractive initial public offering uh, when they're predicting um, negative or, or bad growth or low growth. And then we start coupling or adding that with the rest of the issues that we're facing in the pandemic and the increasing of shutdowns and stuff right now, more restrictions that are planned for the near future. So I just found this was interesting. So ultimately for, for us that, you know, the, the problem was we were never able to get a handle on Airbnb to see how it's affected or how COVID has affected uh, this marketplace. And we can see it's affected it by 40 to 50, it's between 40 and 50% of the revenues uh, our gross booking value has been cut. So that's substantial. And, um, you know, uh, so to me, there, there will be carnage for hosts that will permeate and manifest as time goes on as well. All right. So that's the point. Okay, guys. So what is my point? The point is don't get a false sense of where the housing market's headed. And we are now talking or people are talking about, you know, we have problems. They're not coming out saying we got a housing bubble. Everybody run for the hills. They're saying, we need some solutions or this is going to get worse. We have a housing bubble, but, you know, we're not too sure how it's going to play out. But everyone be aware of it. Unlike the last housing bubble crisis crash, you know, whatever, um, they weren't talking about it or wouldn't talk about it. It was too late. Now we know about it. We know it's coming. The bubble's not the issue. It's just how it plays out. And, that, and that's what it boils down to. So there really is, that's the difficulty as to how, how long will this bubble be perpetuated by the powers that be with the constraint on, on housing and lower interest rates still fueling the marketplace. That's my concern. Um, as I always say, two housing narratives in play. K-shaped housing market, you need to understand your market is hitting both the retail, obviously the retail single family market and the rental market now. But changes are happening. It's starting, it's subtle, but they're there depending on where you live. Um, how do I see that? Off-market, distressed home, shadow inventory. Foreclosure filings are starting to pick up again. I spoke with that a couple of videos ago. And also foreclosure auctions being set. They're starting to pick up in my market and the Florida market. And some other states I've seen, there's an increase in foreclosures being set for auction, which, again, that means uh, someone's going to lose their home and that home will be a distressed property. So the point is, can we get our hands on that before that actually happens and convert that into a save or a better solution for the homeowner? and something and a, and, a, and a cheaper property for a new home buyer. That's the whole point here, guys. All right, so you need to, you need to contact me for consultation to find out about what I'm talking about. Different methods to acquire property, great way to help homeowners face an imminent foreclosure as well as buyers. Give me a shout, how do you do that? Send me an email with your information. There's my email right there. Okay, guys, appreciate the views, likes, comments. Get a hold of me, let's get this moving, and we'll look forward to speaking with you later in the week.